Thank you. Thank you, Chief Minister. We also would like to thank the Vinay for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Uh, today, uh, today I'm going to respond on U.S. US body battle clinics and uh, uh, I've been asked to speak only about the technical details, details and I'm not going to go into the literature uh, about the test and complications of this procedure. Uh, uh, we, we all know that, that trust public consumption has come a long way from a pure drone or an officer to safe and effective procedure. And I think successful U.S. credit readings of pancreatic clinic clinics has been a win in the field of the U.S. US as, as it has ignited the world of U.S. United transmural interventions like biliary, pancreatic duct, and gallbladder drainage. So, uh, gallbladder drainage, initially, it was being done by radiologists. We all know about percutaneous cholecystostomy, uh, where transhepatically a catheter is placed inside the gallbladder to drain the gallbladder, especially in patients who have acute cholecystitis and are unfit for emergency cholecystectomy. The second option was a transpapillary drainage of the gallbladder, which is technically successful in only about 60 to 70 percent of patients, even in experienced hands, where you take your wire and place a stent into the gallbladder through the papilla as we do it for the bile duct. And finally, now we have an EUS guided gallbladder drainage where you drain it, the gallbladder either into the duodenum or into the stomach transmurally. Uh, so the studies have shown that EUS guided gallbladder drainage is safe and effective, minimally invasive alternative to percutaneous as well as endoscopic transpapillary gallbladder drainage. And when we compare EUS guided gallbladder drainage with transpapillary gallbladder drainage, the technical rate as well as the clinical success rate is significantly higher in EUS gallbladder drainage, and it is associated with almost similar adverse effects and lower rates of recurrent acute cholecystitis. So therefore, now in 2020, in centers where the expertise is available, EUS drainage is considered as a procedure of choice for patients who are unfit for surgery. So in this talk, I'm briefly going to talk about the applied anatomy of the gallbladder pertaining to EUS guided gallbladder drainage. What are the indications of this procedure? What accessories we require? What is an important pre-drainage evaluation? And what is the technique for EUS gallbladder drainage? And finally, briefly about the complications and how to manage them. We all know that gallbladder has a fundus, body and neck, with neck being the posterior structure opening in, into the cystic duct. And EUS gallbladder drainage can either be done from the stomach or from the duodenum. The body of the gallbladder lies anterolateral to the distal first part and proximal second part of duodenum. But the important thing is that once you are in the stomach and it's a distended stomach, the antrum of the stomach lies adjacent to the body of the gallbladder. And hence, this is the site for a transgastric puncture of the gallbladder. In contrast, the neck of the gallbladder lies anterior superior to the first part of the duodenum and lies posteriorly. So the neck of the gallbladder, therefore, is the preferred site for the transduodenal gallbladder drainage. So again, to re-emphasize, the body of the gallbladder is the site from where we do the transgastric drainage of the gallbladder. And the neck of the gallbladder is the site from where we do the transduodenal drainage of the gallbladder. Now, what are the indications for EUS guided gallbladder drainage? These indications are evolving. And presently in 2020, the indications for EUS GBD include patients who are unfit for surgery, where it can be offered as a definitive procedure, where you do a drainage followed by a trans stent stone extraction, the procedure which is known as a per oral cholecystoscopic interventions. Then it can be used as a bridge to surgery and an alternative to percutaneous drainage in patients who are unsuitable for emergency cholecystectomy following acute cholecystitis. However, it is important to remember that it should be done only in those centers who have an expertise for therapeutic EUS as well as subsequent elective cholecystectomy with these transmural stents in C2 because transmural stents in C2 makes the cholecystectomy a little bit difficult. Then it can be used as an alternative to either a failed percutaneous or an endoscopic transpapillary gallbladder drainage. Then it can be also used as an alternative to EUS guided biliary drainage in patients with distal malignant biliary obstruction where ERCP is failed and EUS guided biliary drainage is not possible. In these patients, you can do an EUS guided gallbladder drainage to decompress the biliary system. Similarly, patients who have a significant perihepatic ascites, which can preclude a safe percutaneous drainage, one can do an EUS guided gallbladder drainage from the duodenum. And then in case you want to convert an external percutaneous drainage to an internal endoluminal drainage, one can do an EUS guided drainage. 
and importantly patients who have coagulopathy and who are on anti thrombotic and anti platelets where a percutaneous drainage is contraindicated one can do an eos guided gallbladder drainage as studies have shown it to be safer in patients with even significant coagulopathy or patients who are on anti thrombotic and anti platelets what are the contraindications apparently the only contraindication for an eos guided gallbladder drainage is that if you are not able to view the gallbladder either from the stomach or the duodenum it should be closely opposed to these two walls so this is the only uh, contraindications for not doing an eos guided gallbladder drainage what are the accessories required uh, you required a linear array eco endoscope although there are few studies with a forward wing eco endoscope and we have done a few cases with forward wing eco endoscope but without elevator it is very very difficult and i would not recommend using a forward wing eco endoscope for an eus guided gallbladder drainage it should be performed under a combined eus and fluoroscopic guidance it requires a 19 gauge eus fna needle a 0.025 or a 0.035 inch guide wire and then you need an accessory to dilate the tract which could be either a cautery dilating device like a cystotome needle knife or electro cautery enhanced stent delivery system like hot nagi or hot axios or one can use a non cautery dilating devices like tapered cannulas stepped axial dilators or a dilating balloon what about stents studies have been with plastic stents which are pigtail naso biliary drains fully covered metallic stents and lumen opposing metallic stents with plastic stents although the procedure is simpler but there is high risk of bile leaks and in case one is contemplating using a plastic stent one should not use a balloon for dilatation it should be just a cystotome followed by placement of a plastic stent so the lumen is not dilated much and there is not much risk of bile leak fully covered stents have been used initially however they are long they are non opposing and associated with high risk of stent migration so they usually require a placement of a double pigtail stent in through it so that the risk of migration is reduced now we have lamps which include hot axios nagi and spexus so these are two lumen opposing metal stents and they lead on to creation of a closely opposing anastomosis and therefore are considered as the stent of choice for eus guided gallbladder drainage which lamps to be used all the lamps initially are 10 mm they are ideal length for doing a eus guided gbd Uh, if smaller caliber lamps are available like 10 mm or 8 mm they are preferred for gallbladder drainage especially if we are draining it from the duodenum and using the neck in case per oral cholecystoscopic interventions are used then you have to use a larger diameter lamp which is a 15 mm uh, so that your therapeutic scope can go across the uh, stent what about pre drainage evaluation it is very very important once you are embarking embarking upon an eus guided gallbladder drainage the cross sectional imaging especially ct or mri should be carefully evaluated one should look at the detailed gallbladder anatomy the relationships with the stomach and the duodenum and once we are starting an eus guided gallbladder drainage again the gallbladder should be carefully evaluated from both antrum and duodenum to pick up the ideal site for drainage one should be able to identify the fundus body and neck as well as the degree of distension a mildly distended gallbladder should not be drained because of high risk of complications any abnormal wall thickening as well as a mass should also be looked carefully on an eus before one do does a eus gallbladder drainage similarly the gastric or a duodenal mucosa should be carefully evaluated for any ulceration or malignant infiltration because it will increase the risk of perforation and bleeding and finally the site of intended puncture should be carefully evaluated with an eus doppler to detect any abnormal vessels just to give you one example this is a patient with a carcinoma gallbladder having obstructive jaundice so underwent a plastic stent placement there after led on to development of acute polycystitis and if you see this patient was planned for an eus gallbladder drainage but if you look at the neck there is a mass which is closely abutting the duodenum so obviously the duodenum cannot be used to puncture this gallbladder so we have to use the stomach then uh, what about the site whether it should be stomach or duodenum the stomach site is easy because you are targeting the gallbladder body which has got a larger diameter and it allows easier deployment of inner flange of lamps and importantly in case you fail or there is a complication rescue surgery of stomach is much much easier as compared to rescue surgery of uh, duodenum however the problem is stomach as well as gallbladder both are mobile and there are very high chances of stent migration in contrast duodenum is less mobile and more closer to gallbladder 
and plus there are less chances of food reflux in contrast to stomach where there are much higher chances of food reflux leading on to recurrent acute cholecystitis because of stent blockage and however the rescue surgery is pretty difficult in duodenum and it is a technically difficult procedure so if you look at the studies which have compared transgastric with transduodenal us gallbladder drainage the studies have found that there are no significant differences in either the technical or the clinical success rates as well as the frequency of complications between the two uh, routes so hence in an individual patient it has to be individualized depending upon the anatomy so what about the procedural details there are two ways of doing an us guided gallbladder drainage one is a free hand technique where you use a cautery enhanced uh, stent delivery system or over the wire technique as we do it for a pseudo cyst drainage uh, we have to remember that this procedure is a complex procedure unlike a pseudo cyst drainage with gallbladder being a mobile structure and there is a risk of it moving away from the stomach or the duodenum during the free hand insertion leading on to perforation therefore the one step free hand technique without a wire should be used only by experts the advantage of a free hand technique is a speed so in case you know you you want to do the procedure quickly you can use a hybrid technique which combines the speed of free hand technique and safety of over the wire technique here the guide wire is preloaded into the cautery enabled stent delivery catheter and then once you puncture the stomach or the duodenum and the gallbladder you first coil the wire into the gallbladder following a free hand entry and thereafter the stent is deployed only after securely coiling the guide wire and this will prevent the adverse effect of stent migration following the movement of gallbladder away from the stomach stabilizing eco endoscope is one of the most important step because you know when you are doing a gallbladder drainage unlike a pseudo cyst drainage your scope is unstable because most of the time you are in a long or a semi long position and whenever you are deploying a stent the the scope paradoxically tends to move away from the gastric or a duodenal wall so it is very very important to keep your scope in a stable position and once you have done that you uh, puncture the gallbladder using a 19 gauge fna needle and once you have done that first you remove the stent aspirate 2 to 3 ml of bile to confirm the position and send the bile for culture because that will help you in determining the appropriate antibiotics for treatment once you have done that inject of 2 to 3 ml of contrast to delineate the gallbladder as has been done here you can see this is the same patient of carcinoma gallbladder who had acute cholecystitis you can see a plastic stent in place and that this has been punctured and then you just you know coil the guide wire deep deep into the gallbladder make one or two three coils so that the guide wire is secured deeply into the gallbladder and thereafter you dilate the transmural tract you can use either a bougie which is a 6 french or 7 french or a taper tip balloon dilator 4 mm and sometimes there can be a resistant to dilatation using non cautery methods then one can use either a needle knife or a cystotome but in such situations a coaxial dilating system like cystotome should be preferred because of low risk of inadvertent perforation so this is the step of dilating the transmural tract uh, with the balloon and then this is most important thing because whenever you are trying to push a catheter inside you can see the scope paradoxically moves away from the uh, lume, uh, from the gastric wall so one has to be very very careful when one is dilating so in case you anticipate a difficulty with a non cautery dilating system it is always better to use a cystotome because you will not encounter these difficulties of scope paradoxically moving backward and you are losing the access and finally when you deploy the stent so the stent is deployed as was shown beautifully by jahangir same method using both endoscopic ultrasound fluoroscopic and endoscopic guidance to deploy the stent and once you have deployed the stent don't dilate it because post dilatation if especially if you are using a nagi stent as has been used in this case there can be high chances of migration so one can one should not dilate and place a short 3 cm 7 french double pigtail biliary plastic stent so that the uh, metallic stent doesn't migrate what about free hand technique as i have stressed earlier it should be used only by an experts and i would suggest the one who has placed about 20 minimum uh, metallic stents free hand in pseudo cyst should then go on to doing a free hand technique in gallbladder uh, you use the cautery enhanced device the lams delivery catheter is passed inside the gallbladder directly and the proximal flange of stent is deployed under eus guidance as was shown in the live demonstration followed by the deployment of distal flange under endoscopic guidance you may use fluoroscopic guidance or one can do without fluoroscopic guidance also the 
distal flange. So this is the same showing, this is the inner flange which you deployed and then you deploy the uh, outer flange. What about the complications? Uh, it's a relatively safe procedure with minimal complications, but in expert hands, Pooled analysis have reported complications up to 17%. So significant complications can happen, which include bile leakage, stent migration into gallbladder, or more dangerously into the peritoneum, bleeding, gastroduodenal perforations, pneumoperitoneum, and recurrent acute cholecystitis due to stent occlusion, especially because of food, especially if the stomach has been used for the side of puncture. Pneumoperitoneum is the most common complication and is probably speculated to be due to the sheer dilatation of the gallbladder. So hence, minimum dilating force has to be applied during dilatation. And one should use carbon dioxide for endoscopic encephalation. Stent deployment, maldeployment or displacement is the most dreaded complication. And it can happen with even most experienced endoscopists. The trick is not to get scared or panicked. One should, most importantly, don't let lose the wire. The wire, if wire is inside, you can manage all these complications. The stent may either get completely deployed in stomach or duodenum or may get migrated outward into peritoneum. And this is most commonly happens when you are trying to deploy a stent in gallbladder neck from the duodenum and your echoendoscope is in unstable position. So because there is very minimal space for the inner flange to open, so when you are deploying the stent and pulling the sheath, the stent paradoxically just goes inside when the scope comes back and it is deployed freely into the peritoneum. So one has to be very, very careful while deploying the stents that the scope should be stable and the pushing force should be very minimal so that the scope doesn't paradoxically move backwards. As I have been stressing, it's the most important trick to prevent as well as manage stent maldeployment is to ensure that the guide wire remains in place until proper stent deployment has been confirmed both on endoscopy and fluoroscopy. So to conclude, US gallbladder drainage is an accepted minimally invasive non-surgical therapeutic option for management of high-risk patients with acute cholecystitis. Development of a single step cautery enhanced EUS guided LAMS delivery system have made this procedure simpler, but should be done by experts as it can be associated with potentially serious complications. However, there are many unanswered questions which need to be answered by prospective studies like what is the best type of stent, what diameter, what is the preferred site of gallbladder puncture, what are the long-term consequences of leaving the stent inside the gallbladder and how to manage both the stent as well as the gallbladder after the resolution of acute cholecystitis. But the studies have shown and I feel that EUS guided gallbladder drainage is slowly inching towards the prime time and at, gradually at most of the centers, it will be the first line procedure for managing acute cholecystitis. Thank you for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Surinder. It was an excellent talk. And uh, given, uh, Surinder, you can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, sir. Yeah. Uh, given a choice, what would you prefer? Lamps, single, I mean, just uh, accio stent or you use a, a conventional Nagi stent? Sir, given a choice, I will use a lamps because, you know, there are very minimal complications with lamps. Other stents should be used only if, you know, the alternatives are not available or patient is not affordable. Because true in these situations, when you have two structures which are mobile, you need a true lumen opposing stent. I think that is better. And I think, you know, hot nagi may probably help us. You know, hot nagi. I am not used to hot nagi. Probably hot nagi will help us. Yeah, I also don't have any experience with hot nagi, so I'm not sure. I think, you know, by puncturing technique may not be very good because, you know, uh, there will be a lot of chance for complications. So I think, you know, if uh, somebody wants to drain the gold bladder, the best would be to use uh, Accus now. Otherwise, uh, you should be very sure that it is very close to a duodenal or gastric wall. If it is little away, then becomes a problem. And fortunately, what I have noticed is some many of the patients, there is some pericholistic inflammation and it comes and gets opposed to the duodenal or gastric wall. Then it yeah. becomes easier. So the movement of gold bladder can be reduced. So it all depends upon. If you are using a needle and you try to coil the guide wire into the gallbladder, then also the gallbladder tends to move away from the. Yeah, uh, yes, yes. So that again is a problem. So what is your experience? Hot nagi, Matthew, is extremely good. So right. uh, I, I think uh, just now uh, Surinder said about putting a wire in. So putting a wire in uh, increases safety but also causes problems.
Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, so if you have a nicely distended uh, gallbladder because of obstruction, a Hortonaghi uh, placement is pretty uh, straightforward and saves everything, saves time, saves complications. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a very, very good uh, stent for gallbladder. I have not used Spexus, but I have used Hortonaghi, uh, sorry, Hort uh, Axios. Uh, so hot axios, I agree. Hot nagi, I'm talking about. How, no, what, what is the cost? I, I personally have not used a, a hot axios in gallbladders. I have not used hot spexes. I believe you need a little stronger strength. Probably hot spexes will work. But nagi for gallbladders, um, I will be little uh, careful. Little careful, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Because, you know, before availability of hot axios, we have placed few hot nagis and uh, luckily so far it has been okay, but, you know, they can migrate. There is always a problem of uh, the stents getting migrated. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding the speed, I feel maybe with hot axios, putting a wire inside like a hybrid technique would be a little better option because that gives you the safety of wire inside. In case there is a maldeployment, the wire is inside. Yes, yes. I prefer nagi very much for PFC. Um, it's my favorite stent, but uh, anything else like GJ or bile duct or um, gallbladders, I, I think uh, you need a little stronger stent probably. Yeah, when you are using Axios, you know you you get used to the simplicity. It's quite simpler to deploy. You know, <laughs> so if, if a person has probably deployed 15, 20 hot Axios, it will be very difficult for him to go back and deploy a Nagi. <laughs> you are right. It's hot I tell you. Uh, still for um, PFC, I prefer a Nagi over a Axios. Uh, Nagi is definitely love, cheaper. I love, I love is it cheaper? Um, it's efficient also. Migration of Nagi in a PFC can be managed very easily. There is no problem. And plus, it's plus, I think, I think you are doing some procedures, so you all feel that you have done something technically also because hot axios is so simplified that it just <laughs> there is no skill probably involved in deploying that. So yeah. keep keep your skills fresh. You need to keep on putting these metallic stents. Otherwise, you know, it'll be just like surgeons who have been trained in lab coli and then they are not able to do an open <laughs> coli. Uh, Surendra, I just want to ask you one question. Earlier, uh, before this, you no, know, we were using trans papillary gallbladder drainage. I have done so many in the past. You just go through the papilla, I can lay the cystic yeah. duct, even I have used the spyglass to go inside and uh, drain that. I think, you know, you think that uh, transpapillary drainage will go away totally because of this uh, uh, transmural drainage has become so popular now. So the, the problem with transpapillary drainage is like, suppose if you have an acute cholecystitis, which is a little long standing, then these stents, there is all pus inside the gallbladder. Then transpapillary yeah, stents too tend to get blocked. Yeah, so in those situations, you know, what we have been doing is place a naso gallbladder drainage. So place a naso biliary drain into the gallbladder so that you can aspirate and block it. With the transmural drainage, these all issues are not there. So uh, yeah, patient has much quicker resolution of the symptoms in contrast to a transpapillary. And plus transpapillary takes a lot of time. Many times it's pretty difficult to get into the gallbladder. Yes, you, have yes. to use a, you have to use a cholangioscope to look at the gallbladder orifice and go inside. And plus there is a risk of pancreatitis. So looking at all these things, I think uh, once you have a proper stent, if you have an axios, I think US gallbladder drainage is much simpler for the patient. The only sh issue would be that if, whether this such a patient would be able to undergo a cholecystectomy subsequently or not, because uh, our surgeons are a little hesitant to operate such patients right now. One more thing, you know, uh, you know, the commonest practice is to have percutaneous cholecystectomy in patients with acute uh, cholecystitis where surgery is not feasible. Do you think that is going to be away now totally because it is going to be an endoscopy field now? Percutaneous yeah. drainage versus uh, EUS uh, guided GB drainage. Sir, in our country, one of the most important issues is cost also. I know, so, I know. So, you know, if, if, if the person is affording, I think uh, they will prefer an internal drainage. No one will want an external drainage because whatever we have seen, the percutaneous cholecystostomy, the stent, come, the catheter coming out is much higher than a PTBD. Because, you know, in PTPD still it is a little bit anchored. But percutaneous cholecystostomy, patient carrying it for weeks, it's very, very difficult. Okay, Rahul, uh, are we in time? Uh, yes, we are in time. Uh, Professor Puri is ready. Say, say, I just want to ask one question to Dr. Uh, uh, 
uh, ideal care people no technical committee what was what happened in between now the sound is so good eh? what happened in between no, there, there, was issue, there were issues with aig uh, uh, sound system when they were speaking it was coming very smooth when we were speaking to them i think they ah, had that's why they yeah. had multiple uh, things together i think there were three or four uh, uh, mics there so they were interfering with uh, each other so uh, while they were speaking you know, because <laughs> person was speaking no it was fantastic but when we no, were Vinay, them i I, so, i have changed i have changed my devices three four times i thought it may be because of my uh, no, no 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 it was on the laptop then i moved to, now i am talking with the ipad <laughs> i thought it was my mistake you know no no because no. i am, uh, i was getting on messages in my mobile sir your yeah. sound is not clear echoes are there because there yeah. are so many people listening listening from kerala you know so i am yeah. getting lot of messages <laughs> no no now it is everything is clear wonderful yeah it was a, a issue there so now it is all clean so thanks surinder thanks matthew wonderful work oh, wonderful thanks thank you, sir. Very, nice great 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 thank you. very nice lecture great initiative great initiative very nice lecture thank you rao is there chalpati rao is there where is yeah yeah yes sir yeah ah, very here, good sir. very good yeah thanks thank nice seeing you thanks nice, sir nice thank sir. you thank you sir professor rana thank very you very nice lecture sir yeah, thank, thank you. you very much we're going to move on to the next session uh we're going to have a next moderator so professor pankaj desai from uh, professor head at um, you know sids hospital in surat uh, professor praveer rai uh, and professor manoj sahu from bhubaneswar uh, do we have them on board yes i can see dr sahu and uh, professor praveer rai from sgpj in lucknow so we're going to go live to medanta where dr rajesh puri's team is going to uh, do the next live case so if arun could you move on to the medanta So, Dr. Vina, before starting the case, I just wanted to introduce our team who is leading under the guidance of Dr. Gandhi Sud and my colleague, Dr. Suraj Bhagat, who is doing EUS and he is doing all diagnostic and intervention in EUS. So, uh, Dr. Sukrit, I think uh, Sukrit, uh, Sukrit is another guy who is doing endoscopic ultrasound. Then we have a chief technician, Bhagwan, who always assist, and uh, Ashwini is along with him. Both of them assist in US, and we have a fantastic anesthesia team, uh, Doctor Doctor Ashish. Okay, and the case Jubin is going to present, and then we will discuss. Doctor Jubin, can you present the case? Yes. So today we have a 50-year-old male who is have been treated child C cirrhotic no, no, on antiviral therapy. Oxygen. He has decompensated with the cystic and hepatic encephalopathy in past. His current clinical issue is recurrent GI bleed. He has been attempted outside with the one failed glue injection. His upper GI endoscopy shows small esophageal varices but a large GI V2 F2. And he is referred to us for management of GI bleed. And we have discussed everything with the patient. We have discussed regarding the IR uh, guided options, including BRTO. But uh, in the end, we have finally, and the patient has finally decided for an EUS guided intervention. This is these are the images of endoscopy. And now we go live with the case. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Sahu, Dr. Sahu. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. So, before any EUS guided intervention, I always do the endoscopy to check myself. What is the uh, status of the esophageal varices as well as the what is the status of the esophageal varices as well as the status of the fundal varices? So, I I am first doing the endoscopy before starting the EUS and. Uh, so this is upper gi is the scope is the images are visible there yes sir okay. so you see the esophagus has not much of the big varices in yes, fact sir. the grade 1 and uh, um, the endoscope and we can give i will suck all the material i will go to the fundus and you see the large gov2 gov1 okay yes so i think that is very clear gov1 gov2 igv1 and igv2 okay so this is the gov2 okay and this is a large 
barracks which they said they have attempted but i don't see any marker of injection here and patient we always discuss in detail about the treatment options because this patient is a child c cirrhosis with a history of encephalopathy if you see such kind of viruses so we change the scope to the us and while changing the scope i am going to uh, discuss a little bit of the theoretical aspect the question comes why us guided the options are either we do endoscopic guided glue injection the problem with the endoscopic glue one is failure in this distant place and sometimes with the endoscopy you may not be able to obliterate you don't see the complete obliteration the advantage of us you can see the complete obliteration the risk of embolization of the glue is very high the amount of glue required is very high and sometimes people inject 5 to 6 ml of the glue and patient develop glue extravasation and the large ulcer forms as this patient has child c cirrhosis with an in is the brto what is us coil and glue not much of the literature available but the rate of brto in my sample around 3 to 3.5 that is net bhola suni if i do the us guided glue and coil injection it is going to cost him around 60 to 70 so uh, first i will do uh, us now and before that i just wanted to show the accessories which is required so ashwini can you show me the accessories that is important so we have a various size of the coils available so first i will use the 19g needle it will depend you can use the 22g needle also if the diameter of the coil which you are taking if it is less than 10 mm then you can use 22g needle If the diameter of the coil is more than 10 mm, then you should always use 19 g needle. I keep with me at least around two needles if the needle get blocked, and the needle stallet should be removed and it should be flushed with the distilled water or with the 5% dextrose. Avoid normal saline because it produces a coagulation of the glue inside the needle. So one important point: I use 19 g needle. I keep one extra along with me. i try to flush so we always remove the needle stylet can you show the needle first needle which is out so this is the needle which is out and uh, we have removed the stylet from this and we just flushed with the saline well, with the with the distilled water so we make sure that there should not be any air so this one needle without stylet flush with the distilled water in between us second we use a various size of the needles can you show one of the coil so at this moment i have got a coil of 20 mm uh, 20 mm by 14 cm so these coils are available with the cook these coils are made up of platinum alloy with the woven fibers they are 2 cm in size we have got uh, all size of the coils are available that is very important you should either do a pre preemptive ct scan to know about the intramucosal varicose size or you should do endoscopic ultrasound because if you choose a small size of the coil then the risk of migration will be high so either you should have entire length of the coil we keep from 6 mm to the 2 cm size of entire range of the coils and they are available with the co with the name of nectar emulsion coil by the cook we always use heated oil this is a very frequently asked question why do you use lipid oil because you are they're talking about the risk of embolization lipid oil make the glue a little bit more thinner the less coagulation increasing the time of coagulation but the advantage is most of the time in india we have a n butyl cyanoacrylate which has a coagulation time of 5 seconds in the western countries it is available with the n octyl which has a coagulation time of 20 second in 4 second it get blocked people use various method but in my practice of last more than 50 cases i always mix one is to one lipid oil with the coagulation because it is an bolabuck butyl cyanoacrylate and some amount of blood come into the needle risk of blockage of the needle is very high and we have seen most of the time in conferences the needle get blocked only the coil is got in, in, inside the varix and the uh, glue hardly any go because it block the needles so in my practice 
in the last more than 50 cases we always use methadone this we have learned from the radiologist and the coil how to opt what should be the size of coil it should be more than 1.2 times larger than the diameter of the varix so we are going to measure and we will choose the coil of our size so instrumentation we have discussed now i am using the lead echo endoscope which is gf uct 180 the patient is under propofol sedation ideally if the patient is actively bleeding you should intubate the patient and you do the procedure but here it is a elective procedure he is not bleeding he is referred for the further management he is under propofol sedation and all patients in this era you have seen my mask is away because he is covid negative that's why my mask is away otherwise while doing the procedure we are Uh, covered with the mask N95, but this patient is COVID negative. Now we have already done endoscopy. It is GOV2, and you see that I am rotating my scope. The second is I have given the buscopan to this. We have given buscopan to the patient. I will put around 100 ml of the water. Can you give me the water, please? I will distend the fundus with the water. Am I audible there? Yes, 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 Is the US sir. image uh, visible? Is the US image visible there? Visible, visible, sir. Okay. So now, can you see here the large varix? Can you see the large intramucosal varix? Yes. Okay. This is the large intramucosal varix. This is the large intramucosal varix which I am going to inject. This is the large varix. Now, if we look at the anatomy of this varix, the very important thing which I want to highlight. i will just freeze it and now you see that the two varix is are visible here one is the varix which is here and one is here now you always inject intramucosal this is extramucosal this is the spleen this is a dilated chortus splenic vessel of the shunt so the, the message is the injection of the coil and glue should not be into the shunt or it should not be outside the varicel wall outside the mucosal wall it should be in the varix which is intramucosal that is very important i am going to measure the diameter of the varix the diameter of the varix will be this is the varix i am going to measure the diameter you see here it is 13 mm and if i measure from this direction if i measure from this direction this will be around 20 mm okay so any question regarding this now if i see the shunt can you see me? this is the shunt dr yeah. sir or can you show the shunt uh, can you see here now you use the cursor i am just going to remove now you see that this is the large varix this is the large varix this is the varix and you look at this is the shunt below yes where the cursor is there this is the shunt if i follow this you will see i am follow this i will follow this can you see this is outside the muscus propria and going into the can you see this is going towards the splenic vessel have you notice yes yes is this okay okay yes sir so i have a option of using either injecting from this side the root can be trans esophageal or root can be trans gastric there is not much of the literature available but the advantage of the trans esophageal is it keep the needle stable but here i am in the stomach and i am going to use now you look at here these are the large collateral can you see this is the large collateral which is outside the gut wall and this is within the gut wall into the submucosa so this is the fundal varix which requires to be injected 
this should not be injected otherwise there is a migration of the soil and patient will end up into the embolization if you look at here the perforator is very big can you see here the perforator is very big have you noticed yes as the perforator is very big so you should have a little bit of techno technique wise you should be very clear that you should not inject in this you should not inject here you should try to inject here you should try to inject here i am going to inject here is that okay okay sir any question regarding this uh, rajesh i am pankaj here yes dr pankaj yeah. nice to see you and hear you yeah good to see you too and uh, what what would be your indication in routine practice of using this technique coil and glue yeah very good question pankaj uh, i i think is a very good question you raised the common indication of in my practice i don't do all the fundal varics with the us coil and glue my practice is patient with the large fundal varics who has failed endotherapy patient of the large varics who has failed endo endotherapy with the child c cirrhosis or patient who has a encephalopathy patient with the child c cirrhosis who don't have a shunt because for the for the uh, this is called as uh, brta you require a large shunt so if patient is encephalopathy decompensative disease deep jaundice not fit for the tips if patient doesn't has a large shunt and who who is not fit enough for the brto or patient of scc who has a recurrent bleed with the portal vein thrombosis so all the contraindication for the tips number 1 and contraindication or patient is not fit for the brto or you can do by logistic in terms of the in terms of the money brto is costly and the eu has guided coil and the glue is not costly these are the the practice where i do it but we require more data to prove that is it the uh, head to head trial between the brto versus eu has guided coil and glue then we can say which is superior in terms of cost and efficacy yeah and one just one small comment i would like to make regarding the use of lipiodol that you just mentioned yes. we have just published our series of two, more than 2000 cases i have seen you i have, have, have seen where we have not used lipiodol in any and i don't think uh, we and have you have done all us wise you have done all us wise no no this is all uh, simple uh, so pankaj yeah pankaj is very good question and we also do without lipidol we don't right. use uh, because the needle size and the length of the endoscopic yeah. so needle for, for the fundal varix yeah. is very for small for us for us i think it's it makes sense to save that needle yes so, so in, in the routine practice in the endoscopy we don't use lipidol that we always use yeah, i think that message has to go very clear i think So in US wise, we'll show fluoroscopically also when we inject. So lipidol has an advantage of opacity. Lipidol has an advantage because it increases the coagulation time. The needle won't get blocked. Your procedure is completely completed. And US only we use lipidol in endoscopy. We don't use the lipidol. True, that's true. Okay, great. Okay. So should we start the procedure? Yeah, yeah, please. And we'll show step by step. I'm using the 19G needle already flush with the display water. i am using the transgastric approach i have focus which varix i am going to inject so okay patient should be nicely sedated okay you see i think there is a little bit amount of calcification type you see a caustic could be a previous glue injection done in the other hospital so i will again focus it this is the varix which i need to do i will puncture it with this can you make it little bigger So first we will reconfirm by sucking the blood. Uh, I will tell Bhagwan to suck the negative section. Is I am in or not? Because sometimes this septa can create a problem. You see the still the blood is not coming. Can you hold the scope there? 
yes and some mucosa and are injured taken to the some mucosa is taken yeah suck the blood now yes yes now now you visualize the blood just wait can you focus here can you see the blood in the needle is my needle is visible yes yeah now it is visible suck the blood okay now flush flush so needle should not block please flush it now yes you can see the flushing of the water visible yeah yes okay now the second is coil now you focus here on the hand bhagwan show the step by dr suraj or can you guide us how to do it so this coil should be fixed here you know how it has been fixed now we have to use the stylet can we have the enlarged view of the hand please yeah can you enlarge view of the hand my hand enlarge view Flora. And can we see the tip where the coil is? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Basically, you show the flora also. Flora is also visible. You will see. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. When the coil will come, it should be very gradual. The flora is visible. Yes, it is visible. Laura, now you see the coil is coming both in the US view. Can you see the coil in the US view? Yes. And uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Is clear. Is seen the. Uh, is very clearly visible. Yes. You can see now, the flora when you flush with the water. Can you show? Or can you suck the blood again once? Can you make sedation a little bit better to the patient? Yeah. yeah, blood. Can you see my needle is inside only? Yes. Focus. Okay. I don't think that you see the blood started coagulating around the coil. Can you see the US image? We can see. Can you see the blood started coiling. So I prefer to use one coil only. Is that okay? Yeah. I think the blood started. Can you show with the marker? Yeah, you see the blood started coagulating around the, the coil. Can you see? Yeah. Flush. Doppler. Apply the Doppler. Yeah. Put the Doppler. Yes, you see the amount of which is less. What? Now we will inject the lipid oil, and we are planning to inject two ml slowly. Fluoro is on. So please now observe the fluoroscopy. We are going to see the fluoroscopy, please. Slowly. Yes. Yes. Now you see. Fast, girl. Just the water, girl. Put up, put up. Now you see. This was one ml glue and one ml lipid. One ml glue and one ml lipid oil. Okay. Yeah. You see, there is a. Can you see the fluoroscopy? There is a no migration. Yes. And now put the Doppler machine inside in. Now you see the entire. Can you see here? Yeah, we can see. Can you see the Doppler signals? Yes, they have gone. Yes. They have gone. True. Very good. Very good demonstration, Rajesh. So I am going to remove my needle. I am again performing endoscopy because you see the complete. Can you see the complete barracks now nicely? Yeah. Can flow show. Is blocked. Yes. and don't do the over injection of the coil and the glue because now you see the uh, within 24 to 48 hours because of the turbulence in the blood because of the coil it gets start coagulating inside the barrex and the coil, uh, glue is already there so we change the scope we put the upper gi scope in this and we will recheck endoscopically we have got a blood in the us image Rajesh, yes. yes. Uh, what 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 would be uh, the complications which you expect? Uh, sometimes the coil doesn't come out of the needle fully, and uh, we, we have a blockage. 
so the import, important step is your scope should be in the straight position coil doesn't come out if the scope is in the second part of the diagram if your scope is in the straight position then there is no problem or you have used the 22g model that may be a problem is is there any issue if you do a transesophageal puncture of uh, irritating the diaphragm or going through the diaphragm uh, no that is not a big problem the only thing is if the esophageal varices are big right and you should avoid transesophageal otherwise you are uh, what is called as uh, uh, stability is more in the esophagus i would have tried in this also okay so any question anything i will be happy to answer कौन थोड़ा पानी दो एनी क्वेश्चन एनी बडी हैज टिल वी डू द अपर जीआई वाटर प्लीज डॉक्टर राजेश दिस इज मनोज यस डॉक्टर मनोज विद जॉश मैन व्हेन व्हेन यू विल नॉट बी कंसीडरिंग यूएस इंटरवेंशन इन फ्रंटल वेरिक्स या व्हेन आई विल नॉट बी कंसीडर वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन नाउ व्हेन यू टॉक साइंटिफिकली इफ द पेशेंट हैज अ फ्रंटल वेरिक्स व्हिच हैज लेस इंट्रा म्यूकोसल एंड एंड एक्स्ट्रा म्यूकोसल आउटसाइड इज मोर in that scenario i will prefer patient has a severe coagulopathy in that scenario i am going to prefer or patient now you see the varix can you put the water you see the blood is still oozing little bit yes yes yeah i think we can wait for some time or we can inject so the, now at this moment i am going to inject 1 cc of the glue in this can you give endoscopically but uh, the main indication when i'm not you see the size of the varix has reduced significantly have you noticed yes yes there is glue you can see glue also have you checked and i think even we wait for 2 3 minutes this is also going to be better but it's a brisk but i think better you inject a little bit of glue yes i am going to inject we don't require liquid oil okay the size of the varix has significantly reduced so us wise if the large esophageal varices which has not been bandaged then i will not avoid us wise because sometimes there is a rupture of the uh, esophageal varices in that scenario so i will avoid you are ready you are ready if you are ready then let me know i will be if you are ready just let me know because the blood will keep on accumulating the one Let me let me do the suction little bit you have taken so much of time any question detail i will do the endoscopic so uh, dr puri at this point of time you would like to do under us guidance or uh, you Adir, i i i absolutely agree with you i would have done us wise we are doing conference the time is less otherwise i would have done us wise in this case i would not have endoscopic wise I would not have done endoscopy because the time is less. Only 45 minutes are allotted to me, and otherwise I would have done. You see now the bleeding has also stopped. Yes, have you noticed? Come down. Don't put much of it. Don't worry. Okay. Next thing. Can you take out the needle? Lot of time. You want? Should I change the scope? Yeah, in current. Inject now, and we'll see how it is. Yes. Yes. One, two. Yes. In karo. In karo. And see the blue extruding. Put the water. Now see, there is no bleeding. Yes. And you see the significant variation size has significantly reduced after the procedure. Now you have noticed so much of the glue has come out, although there was a puncture site. But US wise, no glue has come out, and uh, it was technically US wise you have done under your major one. And the, my feeling is, we if we we would have waited for some more time, this bleeding would have also been stopped. Mm. any question uh, regarding the us and coil now theoretically when we talk the best is to inject uh, can you show the fluoro darshan ji can you show the fluoro please can you see the fluoro now yes and the coil is there and the glue is still there now theoretically if you use the coil and the glue in comparison to endoscopic uh, guided glue injection then if you use the coil and the glue number of the coil required As well as the amount of the glue required is less, 
because coil act as a scaffolding of the glue so you don't require to inject to total such a big varix we have only injected 2 ml of the glue total 2 ml of the glue and you that dr pankaj desai yes yes what is your feeling in this such a large varix how much glue you have injected in your practice without ems i am talking endoscopically uh maybe around uh, 3 ml to 3.5 ml yeah but we see that in the conference people inject 5 ml 6 ml 7 ml such a big varix uh, no no yeah don't and we see don't see the we don't see the adequacy of the obliteration that is the most important thing here we have seen obliteration and i was quite confident that even if i don't inject endoscopically this bleeding is going to stop because i have already done the us and i have seen the complete obliteration right this is probably from uh, the perforator which was there which you could see it was still feeding it so the if you use the coil followed by the glue the amount of glue required is less the number of coil required is less this is the advantage of using the combination of both can you give the view now you look at here no bleeding Puri, when would you want to see the patient again? So the question from my colleague is, when would you like to repeat the endoscopy? In this case, I don't do the repeat endoscopy. I ask the patient to come after six week. And in your front, you see the size of the varix has significantly reduced. I think it has reduced more than fifty percent. We don't have a therapeutic scope. so this is a diagnostic scope so the material is not coming out but uh, can you give the water so any question dr vinay dr praveer dr uh, sahan you prefer only the 10 mm coils diameter no 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 i according to the size of the varix If the varix is eight millimeter, I use ten millimeter. If the varix is fourteen, then I use sixteen. If the varix is more than fifteen, then I use two centimeter. That we learn from the radiologist that you should opt one point two times bigger the size of the varix diameter. That should be the way how you choose the size of the coil. Fantastic demonstration, Rajesh. Very very nice demonstration. Good case, ideal case, good indication. What? Good teaching. We learned a lot. Okay. Are you going to show anything else, or should we move on to the next lecture? No, we can show other case. Or you want, we can put a US and we can demonstrate what is the status of this varix. Okay, quickly do that. Then we'll go. Can you put the US scope now? Please put the US scope. Is on? Remove the needle. I need a water also. Is everything on now? US. Okay, suction. Please apply the suction. Suction. Ashwini, can you put the suction better? Rajesh, what are the chances of the needle getting stuck in that scaffold with glue and uh, coil? As we are using the as we are using the lipid oil, I don't face this problem. In the literature, it has been shown one or two cases where the needle get uh, caught inside the glue, but in my practice, I have not seen. Can you give the water, please? Doctor Rajesh, yes. Uh, the last fifty cases you have done, any problem you faced? No, not the first. Frankly speaking, it is not because of the conference I am talking. I have used first time upper GI, taken the scope, and that patient has a bleed. Otherwise, it, it doesn't require in the day-to-day -day practice. Can you make it small? So I'm in the esophagus. 
I will rotate. Now you look at here. Now this is the y-axis coming in the view. Now can you apply the Doppler, please? Can you see now? The complete varix is obliterated. Can you see how the Doppler? Please remove the Doppler. Can you see now varix? Yes, yes. Can you see there's nothing is there in the varix? Yes. We just put the Doppler. You see there's no signal. Is clear? Yes, yes, sir. I think this is the advantage. We have injected total 2 ml of the glue and can you put the water, can you give the water for one? We have injected 2 ml of the glue, we know that this varix is solidified. The advantage is under vision you are doing, under real time you are doing and you are sure that I did not have more water. Now you see the complete obliteration very nicely. Yes. And this is the glue cast which has shown the acoustic shadowing which has attached on the gastric wall by endoscopy. You see this is the glue cast which is on the endoscopy. Otherwise you look at here, there is a, can you see the coagulation of the blood here? Yes. And we put the Doppler, you hardly see any vascular signal. So that indicates that you have done the complete obliteration. The size of the varix has significantly reduced. That is another advantage. So I, I think uh, this patient with the large GOV2, uh, with the large varix, with the child C cirrhosis, and who is not willing for the BRTO, and if we do EMS guided coil and glue, that justify. In this case, if you done endoscopically, we will never be sure that how much glue we are injected. With the touch technique, we try to see if it is solidified, we see we have seen that we are completely done. Many of the time, endoscopically, people inject inside the mucosa. And that gives the feeling that you have completely done the injection of the uh, varix with the, uh, the cyanoapyl glue. But in real time, the patent varix is below the mucosa. So I think US-wise, you are very sure that you are completely obliterated and you can see this vision here. You can see here if I focus it very nicely. Now just see here. Now you see the complete varix appears to be obliterated. This is one of the feeder which is there and you see now this. You see? There is a shadowing of the coil and no, no signal. Is the US image available? Yes, and the yes. second advantage is under fluoroscopically, we can show the again fluoroscopy. You see the blue cast is there. The coil is there. And endoscopically we have observed I think more than 10-15 minutes. There is no blood. We can see absolutely clean water. There is no blood. The water coming out with the suction in EMS also image, we can see the clear water and uh, there is no, can we make the endoscopic image bigger? Endoscopic image bigger? Now you see there is no blood, this is the retained blood which was there, there is no fresh blood. Okay? Okay, thank you, that's wonderful Rajesh. Okay, thank you, thank you. Any question, I will be happy to give the answer. And the most important thing is, we never come across with the damage of the biopsy channel of the EUS image. It is always be a fear that people say, remove the needle along with the scope, we use lipid oil, and we have seen there is not a single drop of the lipid oil, and the glue was outside when we do the EUS guided coil and glue. So we never in endoscopy, majority of the time in our practice, we see there was a hole of previous injection. But otherwise, also, the glue cast come out of the varix. In EUS wise, when you inject properly, the entire will remain inside because you are intramucosal within the varix. So that is an advantage. And I think such a large varix and total cost in this patient is 12,000 rupees coil and maybe four or 5,000 rupees glue and the injection and the needle which is patent. And even if the cost, the middle cost is around 14,000, the entire job is in for, for, for 30 to 40,000 rupees. And if I would have done the BRTA, it would have cost him 3 to 3.5 lakhs rupees in my hospital. 
So if I see the complete charge of this procedure, it is not more than 40 to 50,000, including anesthesia, including fluoro, including coil, including coil and glue, and including the cost of therapeutic intervention in the US, not more than 50,000. And we have ensured the complete obliteration of verdicts under EUS also. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Any more questions to Dr. Puri? If not, we can move on oh. to the next uh, talk. Sure. Thank you, uh, Vedanta. Thank you, Dr. Puri and your team. Thank you for the great demonstration. Any questions from the panel? Dr. Sahu, Dr. Rai? Uh, no, excellent presentation. We'll move to the next uh, okay. talk. We next have uh, Professor Praveen Rai from SGPJ Lucknow talking about <laughs> vascular interventions. Thank you, Mr. Rai. Academic demonstration, please.